So, uh, I'm Professor Bob Rosenfield, and uh, we're starting the first of our online uh, vignettes of being in the field so that you guys can uh, at least vicariously share some of that which we've been doing in the field. This class was doing something other than the COVID 19 uh, atmosphere. At any rate, um, I'm here with uh, three young nestling great horned owls. Uh, I would estimate that they're about all oh, three weeks of age and uh, this one here is doing a threat posture. This is uh, a species of bird that breeds throughout the entire western hemisphere but it is restricted to the western hemisphere and we're right at about 44 degrees latitude north. We're right here uh, actually within the confines of the city of Stevens Point. We're just near the edge and uh, great horned owls don't use a nest that they've built because no owl that's on the planet is known to build its own nest. So I found these because I was searching for cooper socks, which I do every spring, and it's April right now, which is late March and April is when I'm very, very busy uh, scouring the woods, uh, backyards, parks, uh, throughout many areas of the state of Wisconsin, looking for reoccupancy of old sites. And what happens is occasionally I come upon some of my sites and a nest is being used by another species, which in this case was great horned owls. So if time permits, and if I'm usually uh, in an education mode where I have students along, then this is a good time for them to get some experience with handling some birds and then seeing the process of uh, marking them with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service leg bands, which have a unique um, uh, numeric rendering on them. And as you can see, there's various sizes for different sized birds. And in my banding bag, I keep this card that has the array of the USGS Fish and Wildlife Service uh, bird band uh, by sizes. And there are acronyms listed on a card like Sharpshinned Hawk and Cooper's Hawk. These birds at this particular stage of their lives, their leg diameter is as big as it's ever going to be. And uh, for those of you who are in this ornithology course, just so you know, this is the standard foot on uh, most of the birds on the planet. And there's like 10,000 species. And by far, most of the birds have three toes pointing forward and one toe pointing backward. But the owls have what is called the reversible fourth toe. Uh, and that's this digit. This is digit number two, digit number three, digit number four. And this is digit number one, which is the halix. But on owls, this digit can be moved with facility. At their will, they can move it around, which probably helps them grab prey in the night when they can't see quite as well. And uh, also for climbing on trees. And if they're nesting in a nest cavity, they can use the dexterity of that outside toe to help them manipulate themselves up out of a cavity or on tree branches. Uh, these guys are trying to get out of the nest, if you will, as fast as they can. This is a little faster than what they're supposed to be doing, but we're gonna put them back relatively soon because the nest is a very dangerous place. And so the adults are trying to raise their kids as fast as they can. And a very important aspect of their body are these feathers right here. So these are flight feathers that are coming in. These are actually primaries and they're being fed by blood. And this sheath is protecting the incoming relatively fragile feather. And at some point when the feather is fully grown, which would be probably out to here, um, this sheath will give way and eventually all these feathers uh, will become what is called hard penned. They will be metabolically inert for the rest of their lives. And every summer they're gonna have to molt them out because they'll be degraded by solar energy, by physical trauma. Um, owls have very soft, velvety feathers. And this uh, order, which you guys will learn is the Strigiformes, which is a worldwide order. There's about 220 species of owls. Uh, there's another closely related order that you're going to learn about, which are called the Capromulgiformes. That contains nighthawks and uh, the whippoorwill, and they have velvety plumage like this, very soft to the touch. And it's the physical construct of the feather that makes it so soft. And what it tends to do is it's, there's, a, 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 there's a porosity because the feathers have this velvety touch to them and air can move through such that it tends to muffle the sound of the bird at night so they don't alert their prey when they're approaching it. It also, because it's so quiet at night, they aren't, uh, if you will, uh, disturbed by outside noise also. 
because they're relying so much on their ears. All those have a facial disc, which is uh, right behind this eye. Uh, I think I'll get to that in a bit here more. By the way, it's bill snapping. It's warning me that uh, uh, it's dangerous. By the way, this is a sear. This is the proximal part of soft tissue. This fleshy protuberance on the base of the bill only occurs in certain orders that you guys are gonna learn about. Nocturnal birds of prey, like owls, have sears. Parrots uh, have sears, and the macaws do. Daytime birds of prey have sears. And pigeons uh, and the doves, the columbiformes, also have sears. So that's what this is, and you can see the mouse is right inside. And then, of course, you can uh, see the beak. Owls, of course, have facial discs. They have relatively large heads. And the reason they do so is to accommodate what are actually very large eyes, proportionally, and they have very large ear opening. The ear opening starts about right here, and it ends right back in this area here. And maybe later on when I'm using both hands, I can show here. Let's see here. All right, little fella. There you can see the ear opening. This is a very large ear opening. There you go, I'm gonna put this back. There you go, little fella. Owls have feathered uh, legs. And as you guys are learning, this part, this is, there's a bone here. It's all covered with feather, of course. But this bone is an analog to your heel of your foot. Birds walk on their toes, and this is the front part of their foot, front part of our foot, if you will. And then this leg, this part of the leg is actually uh, your heel. Uh, this is called an anisodactyl toe arrangement pattern, which again, I'm using terminology that you guys will be responsible for. So three toes to the front and one toe to the back, and probably evolved uh, way back in the day, which evidence is rather overwhelming to suggest that uh, theropod-like dinosaurs like T-Rex and Velociraptor were probably the origin of modern day birds. And in fact, it used to be thought that these feathers, there's somebody you don't want. These feathers uh, used to be thought, and in fact, when I took ornithology several decades ago, these we were taught that these were modified reptilian scales. The evidence suggests that is not the case, that these evolved in uh, dinosaurs, and it was a separate, if you will, fibrous protein. And by the way, this is not, it is the fibrous protein is known as keratin. So. Anyway, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to ban them. I'm going to mark them. I usually ban on the right leg. Uh, you can ban on either leg. I like to be systematic and stay the same at all times. So uh, I need to make sure that. So uh, I'm going to open this band. This is an aluminum band, and these are called lock-on bands because it has a flange that's going to fold over and, if you will, uh, seal uh, this band. Uh, some bands are not called, they don't have a flange, these are, uh, they're not lock-ons. These are called butt-end bands. And I just open this band and I close it flush on itself and a bird can't open that. But all those big birds, ospreys, eagles, uh, they have a powerful enough beak that they might be able to take this apart if it was just a butt-end band. So that's why there's a flange and a lock-on, if you will, construct to this particular marker. So I'm going to open it up. You don't open it up very far, because if you open up too far, you're gonna weaken one side of it. You just need to open it up far enough to get it onto the leg. Remember, the leg is attained its diameter that will have the rest of its life. So this band will put on, at this particular age, will turn very freely on this bird's leg. So then we're gonna tighten it, and then we're gonna turn it around so you don't have any feathers locked into the flange here. And then I'm gonna to start to manipulate these are buggers. Okay, so then I'm going to crimp this flange over. And you can see it's all locked over that flap. Okay. And again, these numbers are all in sequence. Yes, this bird's done. Help them grip their prey. It gives them a little bit more of a texture to the bottom of the foot, which gives them reliable contact of their prey. 
And briefly, a few more words about uh, the talons. Uh, they're long and sharp. Obviously, they're used for killing prey, but they're also used for carrying prey. They're used for defense of themselves, and they can be used for climbing, especially if they grew up in a nest cavity and they need to extricate, so to speak, themselves from that cavity. Uh, to make a little bit of uh, this underwing look relatable to your arm and the under part thereof, uh, this first circled part is the elbow, and then you'll see the wrist. So these feathers that are more distally uh, placed uh, farther out on the wing are known as the primaries. And all birds of prey of the world, both the owls and the daytime, have 10 of them. And here you can see them growing, and they're going to provide thrust on a downstroke of a wing flap. So very important for horizontal movement uh, towards the Earth's surface. And these feathers that are more proximate, which means uh, closer to or in proximity to the main body, uh, these are known as the secondaries. And their principal role is to provide lift on a downstroke of this wing or the airfoil. And here again, I believe I mentioned this earlier, but here is a sheath, this blue part, uh, that uh, encapsulates and protects the uh, uh, growing feather and if you look closely, you can actually see a little bit of the uh, red tint of the blood that would be carrying the protein. And again, that's known as keratin. That eventually is going to uh, make up the uh, uh, hard structure of the feather itself. Feathers, of course, do not have, they're very expensive. They should not grow on every part of a bird's body. Uh, penguins are odd, but because uh, they do there. But on most other birds like this all, there's a naked portion of the body called the aterile. And those regions are uh, areas of the skin that feathers do not grow from. And there's a variety of advantage to that, not least of which is keeping the expense of the plumage down. But also, it's a good place to dissipate excess heat because birds tend to run high body temperatures. By the way, when you grab a bird of prey, a bird this big, uh, obviously the most important thing, or maybe not so obvious, but I'm going to tell you is, I'm going to go some of this stuff is to pick them up and get a firm grip by uh, gripping the base of their legs. Don't ever grab them by a wing. Here, let me clean some of this stuff off here. There we go. Don't pick them up by their wings. Don't ever pick them up by their head. Always get a nice, firm, reliable grip around the base of their legs. Their legs are very strong, relatively speaking, at this stage of their lives. And imagine that, that you're up in a nest. In fact, that nest that uh, these birds are in is 70 feet above the ground. It's very windy today. And when wind blows and that tree is shaking and you're little, you've got to be able to hold on to the nest. So you can imagine how these legs probably are rather adaptive in terms of having strength at this particular stage. And these talons probably help too. So this is an excellent way to uh, hold this bird of prey is by their legs and support them from underneath like this. Uh, that way you have a reliable grip, uh, you're safe, uh, they usually can't hurt themselves and uh, they can't hurt you and you are less likely to injure them, uh, if you will, by having unreliable contact. Yes, this is the only time in the bird's life that they are going to be molting slash growing in all of the feathers on their body, of which there are thousands. Uh, I'm going to guess four to five thousand on a great horned owl. Uh, and it's the only time they will grow all their feathers all at once. Good time for them to be grown all at once to give them insulation, etc. But they don't have to go out and get food. Mom and dad are feeding them. They're providing them warmth. From here on out, they will not be able to drop all their feathers and grow them all at once. So this is the only time. And get them grown as fast as they can. By the way, this bird that here is in my left hand, a hallmark of a great horned owl is they're, they have yellow eyes, they have a black bill, they have orange facial disc, and you can see some of that color coming in around their eyes, and that facial disc allows them to concentrate sound. Um, they also have a white bow tie, a neckline, just beneath the base of their head. And uh, there's only a couple owls here in North America. Great gray owls have that. Uh, but that's a hallmark of a, a great horned owl with these yellow eyes, uh, the dark beak, and these feather tufts coming up on top. These will be the, quote, horns. They aren't horns, they're just feather tufts. They'll be used for camouflage and for uh, courting purposes. 
And that white bow tie coming in at the bottom is a very important uh, component to uh, according dynamics. Uh, here's a great look in slow motion of the third eyelid, also known as the nictitating membrane, and it is to moisten and protect the eye. Now let's not forget that this organism is an animal and it's recognized in a formal way by science, by a branch called taxonomy. So this organism is in kingdom animalia, it's in phylum chordata, that's a phylum that contains organisms that have a dorsal nerve cord and in this case a backbone. It's in class aves, that's the bird class. It is in the order strigiformes. And within that order of owls, which is a worldwide distributed group, it is also in the family uh, Strigidae. And then comes the genus species. And in this case, it's Bubo virginianus. And then the common name is Great Horned Owl. Again, these are all offshoots of that formal branch of taxonomy.